happy. We've got a pretty cool design, I think. The way it works here is when you get input from the user, you get into your application, and you call the validator when you need to use that data. You call the validation engine, and there's a bunch of methods available to validate your input. So if you've got a credit card number, you've got some other kind of input that you've defined in a regex, it's very configurable. But you can get safe content back from the validator. Underneath the hood, the validator calls a decoding engine and decodes the data with a bunch of different decoders. And it handles double encoding. So uh, I think this is beyond the state of what I've seen, in, in, at least in my experience, of what's out there for handling uh, input validation. So if anybody says, hey, we've got this great input validation library, just ask them, how do you handle canonicalization? Because <laughs> this stuff is really hard. <laughs> so this all happens under the hood. A couple of cool things that are, are going on over here. We've got this get valid safe HTML call. That's layered on, I'm sorry, that's layered on top of the anti sami library, which I mentioned this morning. It's for when you have to accept HTML into your, into your site and then render it as part of web pages, like if you're a MySpace or an eBay, like Robert Hansen was talking about a few minutes ago. What that call does is it returns you a safe version of that HTML. It parses the HTML, strips out any tags according to a configurable policy, and returns you a safe version that won't have scripting attacks in it. So that's cool, and there's a nice easy API to that in ISAPI. Uh, there's a few other things. There's a safe read line function to replace Java's broken read line function that can read forever and cause an out of memory exception, take down your VM, uh, a few things like that. Okay, so that's uh, input validation. We've got a, a nice engine here. The next thing I want to talk about is output encoding. And to do this, I need you to understand that inside a web page, there are a bunch of different execution contexts. The typical one that you think of is sort of you know, inside a JavaScript block. But you can also put code inside a CSS page or inside uh, an HTML uh, attribute, like an event handler. You can put it in uh, a, a URI. There are lots of different places where code can go inside a web page. And each one has different coding rules. So that, that advice that you see in your best practices document that says always use HTML entity encoding before you put something in a web page, well, it's a good idea, but it's not quite accurate. You need to use the right encoding for the places that this data will land in the web page. So for CSS, you need to do this kind of encoding. For JavaScript, there's a slight variation of that. It's a different parser. It needs a different escape syntax. Same thing for elements and attributes. Event handlers all have a different encoding style. So you need to have a set of encoding methods that you tell your developers, uh, use this encoding method for this particular HTML context. That's the way to prevent scripting attacks in web pages. So we've got a nice library of these in ISAPI. Uh, there's this encoding engine that I talked about. There's a set of codecs that implement these uh, different formats. And it's fairly straightforward to use. In your presentation layer, you simply call the appropriate encoding method for the context that you're putting the data into. Uh, there are also encoders for other things. There's encoders for SQL, encoders for LDAP, encoders for other backend systems that you need to encode output for. So the idea here is that we can prevent all injection attacks using the encoder. Someone actually pointed out to me that you can encode for different operating systems. So in Windows, there's an escape character. In Unix, there's a different escape character. So now we have uh, encode for execution purposes as well built into ISAPI, if you're calling the native operating system. So that's output encoding. Uh, let's talk about authentication. This is a, a tough area for developers. They've got to write a lot of custom code to handle this. What we've tried to do is simplify this down to where it's very easy. So uh, essentially what the developer has to do is call login on any page where, uh, you know, on any flow, like in the controller or any other flow where he expects the user to be logged in. And then anywhere else in the application, he can ask for the user object and get a hold of the currently logged in user. Now that's used under the hood in a number of places. That's used in the access control checker. It's used in the logger. So all those things have access to the user object sort of throughout the application. So we've dramatically simplified 
uh, the way that you handle authentication within an application. Um, so compare it to if you didn't have this. If you didn't have this, you, you end up having to pass around the session or some other way of conveying the currently logged in user all throughout your application. With a SAPI, you can just get the user from wherever you want. So you, there's a, a lot of complexity lost here. There are also a bunch of supporting methods that uh, we've provided to do things you know, that people want to do related to uh, authentication. You can do encrypted cookies very easily with the API. There's CSRF tokens built in, so uh, it's fairly easy to implement that. Uh, you can do things like change your session ID. Java actually has no provision for changing your session ID, but it's something that every web application should do. When you go from unauthenticated to authenticated, you need to change your session ID so that the attacker can't use the session ID that you exposed before you authenticate it. So we got a simple provision in here that, that does it under the hood. Actually what it does is it copies the contents out of your existing session, creates a new one, copies the contents over into the new one, and invalidates the old one. But developers aren't going to be able to get that right. We've spent a lot of time figuring out how to get this just right. Uh, you can do remember me cookies, and we argued a lot about this. A lot of people don't like remember me cookies. But at the end of the day, we decided, you know what, there's an awful lot of sites out there that need this, and we need to show them how to do it correctly. So we're creating an encrypted token as the remember me cookie. It has a timeout, and it also will be invalidated if the user changes their password. In a lot of sites, if you get a remember me cookie, and the user changes their password, the remember me cookie is still good which is a problem. You need to have a way of allowing users to invalidate the remember me cookie. So we've got all that built into the API. Let's talk about access control a little bit. This is a real challenging area for developers and uh, we see quite a lot of mistakes in this. This isn't the kind of thing that a scanner can find. What we've, uh, what we've done in SAPI is we've provided a number of different methods to allow developers to do access control at the right point in their application so that they, uh, uh, well, so that they can, you know, implement the policy that they're really trying to implement. The first thing is, is authorized for URL? You probably call this in your controller to check that the user is allowed to access the URL that they've, uh, they've selected. We've got a, is authorized for function call that you'd call from your business function. This is a simple check to make sure that the user is authorized for that function. Notice that this is a little different than what's built into Java or the other languages. Most, most platforms have something like a check that says, is user enroll? Which isn't exactly the simplest thing for the developer. So we see a lot of code that has, if user is enroll uh, manager, and they're logged in from an external connection, and it's Tuesday, and the moon is full, and a whole bunch of Boolean connections, uh, Boolean math to figure out whether a user is uh, authorized. That's complicated. What we're trying to do is encapsulate all of that decision inside an is authorized for kind of function. That way, if you need to change the rules or audit the rules, you don't have to go rooting around through a million lines of code. You can look at how the policy is actually implemented in these methods and verify that it works correctly. So we're really trying to simplify the job for the auditor as well as the developer. So deeper into the application, you need an is authorized for data call. So even if the user is authorized for the URL and the function, maybe they're not allowed to execute it with someone else's data, right? So we need three different checks here. There's a few others. You can check if they're authorized for a service or for a